first problem says an apartment building has nine floors and each floor has four apartments. The building owner wants to install new carpeting in eight apartments to see how well it wears before she decides whether to replace the carpet in the entire building. The figure below shows the floors of apartments in the building with their apartment numbers. Only the nine apartments indicated with an asterisk have children in the apartment. That sounds like some off the wall information to be telling us there, don't you think? Like, why would they mention the fact that there are some apartments with children? We will discuss that here in a bit. So for part A, it says for convenience, but they're not saying convenience sample. They're just saying this would be an easier thing to accomplish here. But the apartment building owner wants to use a cluster sampling method, which was a legitimate method in which the floors are clusters to select the eight apartments. Describe a process for randomly selecting eight different apartments using this method. So number one, you need to remember how did a, cl a cluster sample work? And they're saying the floors are the clusters. So if the floors are the clusters and we need eight apartments, what are we gonna have to do? Like right, we're gonna need to randomly select two floors. And once we randomly select those two floors, what do we do with those apartments on those floors? We take them all. We don't take some of them. That would be a stratified approach. We want them all. Now, when they say describe a process, this is where, if we think back towards the beginning of the chapter, we talked about three different ways that we could write a process. We could either use something like the hat method. We could use um, technology to randomly pick the numbers for us, or we could use the random number table. So, if they're not specifying how to describe this process. So it is completely up to us how we do it. So what would you prefer to do? Hat method, technology, or random number table? Sure, let's do a hat method. All right, so let me move, let me move this up so we can get some space in here. All right, so if we want to use the hat method, what do we need to do first? Well, they're already labeled. But if we're using the hat method... I mean, are we going to physically put like the the floors inside a hat? Yeah, just assign paper one. Right. That's, that's we need the papers right. for the hat method. So label nine identical pieces of paper with numbers one through nine. Now, remember, we're not using the random number table, so we don't have to worry about like zero one to zero nine. We just need numbers on these. All right. So each floor has a piece of paper that is linked to it. Then what do we do with those nine identical pieces of paper? Oh, but first we need to put them in a hat, right? Do we need to fold the pieces of paper? No. Is that important? No. Not really, right? As long as the papers are in the hat and we shake the hat up, that's the main thing. So Sam, if you wanted to say, fold them all the same way. Sure. That works. That you, you get nothing for that, but you don't get anything taken away. So we are going to uh, put, put the papers in a hat and shake it up. Mix up the papers. Somehow describe that you are randomly mixing these things up here. Okay, so the papers are in the hat. We've shaken it up. Now what? Three, six, I mean, I've got to shake it up. So now draw how many? Two. 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 Random. Could they be the same? No. No. We need to draw two different slips of paper. Random. Now the random part is when we shook up the hat. So, I mean, how would you randomly pick the papers out of the hat? Right. So, I mean, if you wanted to throw that part in there, sure. But you could just say, draw them. Just draw them out. They should already be randomly mixed up because we shook up the hat. So, draw two different slips of paper. And that will be your four apartments. Now, here's where, this is where I think a lot of people would stop because they would say, yeah, here's my two clusters. These are my two floors. But they didn't want you to describe a process to select the two floors. 
they said describe a process for randomly selecting eight different apartments. So we are like 95% of the way there of getting those eight different apartments. So we've got those two slips of paper that represent two floors. And then this is where you need to have that full understanding. So this is where we need to verify that we really know what a cluster sampling technique is. It's not just that we select the clusters, but now what do we do with all those apartments on those two floors? We take them all, right? That's where we're getting the eight different apartments from. So kind of the fourth step in this scenario would be now take all four, I'm gonna do APTS for apartments. Now take all four apartments from both floors to get the eight total apartments. I can very easily see people telling me all the way up to step three, they got those two slips of paper, but they don't basically um, equi equi equivalent. Is that a word? Equivalent? I'm making it up. New Ruby proud of me. Equivalating that those two slips of paper are leading you to get the eight total apartments. I know in your guys' minds, you're thinking, yeah, these two slips of paper are going to get me eight apartments, but you need to give that little bit of detail because that's really showing you understand how a cluster sample works versus a stratified sample. So there's part A. Questions with part A? Yes. Do we do that? Do we do that exactly? The final step, like, um, I put check the papers and select all rooms on the corresponding floors. Yeah, so that would be fine. Like here, I'm just saying, like, we've got four, uh, four apartments, both floors. It's kind of like saying four times two equals eight. So yeah, so if you said use all the apartments on those floors, that by default, you're getting eight. So yeah, that would be fine. All right, anything else on A? All right, B, an alternative sampling method would be to select a stratified random sample of eight apartments where the strata are apartment with children. So now we're talking about, oh, look, there was that, that asterisk thing that we were talking about earlier. So we got apartments with children and apartments without children. A stratified random sample of size eight might include two randomly selected apartments with children and six without children. So notice they didn't just do four and four, right? I mean, we would think ideally we should do four and four, but they said maybe might include two with and six without. So it's okay if it's not 50-50. They're telling us that's okay. So it says in the context of the situation, give one statistical advantage of selecting such a stratified sample as opposed to a cluster sample like what we did in part A. So now if we go back and look at that picture, and here's where I want you to think, worst case scenario with our cluster sample. What could theoretically happen in our cluster sample that might all of a sudden produce some issues about apartments with children and without children? Sure. Like what if randomly we select the third floor and the sixth floor and all of those apartments don't have kids in them. So here's where you got to start to think outside the box a little bit. Why might kids be an issue with new carpeting? Dirty. Wow. They're messy. Don't hold back against kids here. <laughs> Not long ago, you guys were kids. Yeah. So kids are dirtier, messier. I mean, maybe they're going to spill stuff on the carpeting. Maybe it doesn't clean as easily. Um, what else besides them being dirty? <laughs> With dirt, filth, stink. There's more people. What other kind of effect might kids have on carpeting? Right. They're going to be running around, right? They, they got toys or, you know, they're going to be covering more ground in this apartment than, you know, let's say like grandma and grandpa live in apartment 61. And all they're going to be doing is walking from their recliner to the refrigerator, to the bathroom, back to the recliner. Like they're not going to be, you know, running around on the carpeting. They're not going to be like running and sliding on the carpeting. They're not going to be playing with their toys on the carpeting. Like kids are just going to be, in general, tougher on carpeting. So 
that's kind of the difficult part about this problem is you kind of have to think about why would kids being in an apartment present a difference here compared to apartments that didn't have children? All right, so when we write this answer out, we really need to write two separate things that are linked together. Number one, we need to talk about the statistical advantage of using a stratified sample, but we're also going to need to, need to discuss kind of the con of using a cluster sample. So it's great if you tell me what's great about the stratified sample, but you also need to tell me why that all of a sudden is a bad thing for the cluster. So we're going to have to talk about the pro of the stratified and the con of the cluster. So I would say we just talked about the con of the cluster is we could theoretically select two floors that don't have any kids on. Them. And then we're not truly going to know if that carpeting is great carpeting for all apartments because we think kids might be tougher on the carpeting. Now, I, there's a really good chance you're going to end up with two, two floors that are probably going to have kids in them, right? I mean, how many floors are there altogether that don't have any kids? Three. Three of them, right? The third, the fourth, and the sixth. There's a really good chance you're probably going to pick, um, you know, the first, the second, the fifth, the seventh, eighth, or ninth floor as one of your two clusters. There's a really good chance that's going to happen. But theoretically, you might pick the third and the sixth, or the fourth and the sixth, or the third and the fourth. It could happen. So let's talk about first why the cluster sample is bad. So I would say that we could possibly pick, randomly pick, two floors that have no children. And children might be, this is gonna, you're gonna pick your word here, tougher, rougher, harder, harder, better, faster, stronger, um, I don't know, dirtier, what, whatever, whatever you wanted to throw in there, okay? Children might be, I don't know, they're gonna be different, but you gotta describe how they're gonna be different. So I would say if you picked any one of those four terms, you're describing the difference there. And children might be tougher on carpeting than adults. So there's the con of using a cluster sample. We could potentially pick two floors with no kids and then we're not going to know if this new carpeting is really great for all apartments. So now, let me go in green here. So now for the one statistical advantage, we would say with a stratified, I'll do RS for random sample. With a stratified random sample, we will guarantee that we will select, no, again, I'll do APTS for apartments. We will select apartments with and without children so that we will see um, how the carpeting wears in both types <clears throat> of apartments. So they may find, um, maybe in the non-kid apartments, maybe they find that the carpeting they put in works great for adults or old people. And so then maybe they decide, hey, how about the apartments that have kids Let's spend a little bit extra money and let's buy a higher quality 
heavier duty carpeting just in those apartments because man alive, those kids tore the crap out of this carpeting. We need something better. Let's spend a little bit extra money on just those apartments. Now, part of the problem with that might be these people aren't going to live in these apartments forever, theoretically, like they may move out. So like, I don't know, grandma and grandpa die. They get moved into an old folks home. They, I don't know, they, I don't know, they, they, they move in with their kids or something. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, like a new family moves into that apartment and it's got the, the old people carpeting. So there's always issues to consider here. All right. Questions with part B. So I would say this is a very common uh, free response type question. Where notice in part A, they had a cluster. Part B, they had stratified. And then ultimately in this problem, they said, hey, let's talk about why one of these is better than the other. Now, in this one, they said stratified is better than a cluster. There could be a completely different problem where we may say cluster is better than stratified. Oh All right, number two. Because of concerns about employee stress, a large company is conducting a study to compare two programs, Tai Chi or yoga, that may help employees reduce their stress levels. So they go on to describe what Tai Chi is. They go on to describe what yoga is. Basically, just think of Tai Chi and yoga are fairly similar to each other. They have different origins, um, but it, it's kind of the same idea, right? It's like slow breathing and stretching. You're not really doing like rigorous exercise here, but it's more about like decompressing, but also, I don't know, kind of like strengthening your core, essentially. All right, it says the company has assembled a group of volunteer employees to participate in the study during the first half of their lunch hour each day for a 10 week period. Each volunteer will be assigned at random to one of the two programs. <laughs> Volunteers will have their stress levels measured just before beginning the program and 10 weeks later at the completion of it. So part A, a group of volunteers who work together ask to be assigned to the same program so that they can participate in that program together. Give an example of a problem that might arise if this is permitted. Explain to this volunteer group why random assignment to the two programs will address this problem. So think about an example that might arise. Why might it be a bad idea to allow people to decide which group they want to be in? Because they want to be with their friends. Your right. So this is again, this is kind of like talking about the, the children with the carpeting example. You got to think a little bit outside the box here. If you're allowed to work with your friend, your coworker friends, um, what do you think is going to naturally happen to your stress levels? Yeah, it's probably going to go down. You're hanging out with people you like, right? So now we got to discuss if you get to hang out with people that you like that are your friends. Um, when we see that your stress level goes down, is it because you hung out with your friends or was it because you did Tai Chi or yoga? We don't know. What was that called? Confounding. So, so allowing the people to decide for themselves, that's kind of a confounding variable, right? But they're saying, Hey, we shouldn't allow people to be with who they want to be with. Let's let random assignment choose that for us. The other thing to consider here is what was the, what was really the main reason why that we should use random assignment in an experiment? What did using random assignment allow us to conclude in an experiment? Causation. Right. So without random assignment, what are we, what can we conclude? Correlation. Right. We can see a correlation. But we can't say that the treatment was the thing that caused a change in the response period. All right, so now let's start to consolidate all that there. So random assignment, oh here, let me just do RA. Random assignment will allow us to establish causation 
over correlation. Now, someone earlier um, said, well, even if we use random assignment, couldn't it theoretically happen that all of those people are randomly put into the same group? I said, yeah, that could happen. Will that confound the results of the experiment? Absolutely it will. But if we allow random chance to put the people in the groups for us, then that was beyond our control. Okay, so it's not like you can just say, hey, randomly, you go over here, you go over there. And then everybody in one group's like high fiving each other because they're like, yeah, we're all in the same group. And then you're like, well, crap. Well, no, I can't let that happen. Okay, half of you go over to the other group. You can't just decide to do that because then you're introducing a whole new type of bias into that. So we want to establish causation. We don't just want to see a connection or a correlation. So we're just going to let random assignment do this. Now, we also need to talk about the, the first thing we mentioned, that being with, being with your friends will, I'm going to say likely, because is being with your friends always a stress no. reducer? No. No, right? So being with your friends will likely reduce your stress levels. So then we won't know if the reduction was due to the treatments, aka the Tai Chi and the yoga, or, or I guess I'll say and or, hanging with your friends for half of your lunch hour. And again, what was that called? Confounding. Confounding. Now, there really could be a difference in the treatments. Like maybe, maybe Tai Chi does reduce your stress more so than yoga, but we won't be able to truly know what ultimate effect, like how much of a reduction, like what percentage in reduction um, was attributed to Tai Chi versus yoga versus how much of that reduction was because you got to hang out with your friends for half your lunch period. Questions? Part A? All right. Part B. Someone proposes that a control group be included in the design as well. The stress level would be measured for each volunteer assigned to the control group at the start of the study and again 10 weeks later. What additional information, if any, wouldn't that be like a kick in the whatever if, if the answer was, oh, there is none, right? Why would they say if any? I mean, there might not be, but wouldn't that be such a stupid question to ask on the AP exam? What additional information? None. Wow. Wow. Thanks for that awesome answer there. Yeah, there, there is none. But what additional information, if any, would this provide about the effectiveness of the two programs? So what we first need to discuss is if they do include a control group, what would that control group look like? What would they experience? Nothing, right? We're just going to say, hey, that first half of your lunch hour each day for a 10-week period, you just do whatever you want to do. Now, what might those people do during that half hour? Sure. I mean, could they go outside and be like, I'm just going to do Tai Chi on my own? Maybe. They could do crossword puzzles. They could read. They could go to the bathroom. They could, you know, call somebody. They could, who knows? But could they do something that would lead to a reduction in their stress levels? Yeah. They could, right? Now, the other thing to consider here is, again, you got to think outside the box here. So I want you guys to imagine you work for a large company. Now, they don't give any specifics about this large company. Right. But let's say you work for a large company. Okay? And let's say at this large company, they have... I don't know, like a project comes up. 
So you've got a, a project, you have to meet deadlines. What do you think is going to be true about your stress levels? Right. So you're under a deadline. You've got stuff to get done. You got stuff to turn into your boss. I mean, your job's kind of on the line here, right? So what if there was a big project at work and all of a sudden, and so let's say this is like right before this program begins and they go, man, everybody's stress levels are through the roof. Well, what if this project ends in eight weeks and this is a 10 week experiment? What are we probably going to see is true about everybody's stress levels after 10 weeks? After the project's done. After the project's done. Like you have turned in your proposals. You've basically done like all the hard work. Oh, no, 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 no. So I'm saying like, what if after eight weeks, you're done with your big projects at work? And then you still have two more weeks to go by, right? So, I mean, even if we said the project, your big project at work ended the day before the 10 weeks was up, your stress levels are going to go down because you're not as stressed out at work. Um, another thing to consider would be like, what if right before the Tai Chi yoga experiment, there's some word going around the company that um, some people are going to get laid off. Yeah, or they're going to sell to a different company. What's going to happen to your stress levels? They're going to go up. And then let's say 10 weeks later, it all gets resolved. You still have your job. Nothing has changed. What's going to happen to your stress levels? They're going to go down. Okay. So this control group is really going to provide a, a baseline to compare the Tai Chi and the yoga to. All right. Because again, there could be other variables variables what can we call those other variables? Confounding variables right so i just mentioned some confounding variables like what if there were layoffs what if there was a big project but what if there were other variables that lurking i did not consider variables. those would be lurking variables so there could be other variables confounding or lurking that would maybe make the stress level change either increase or decrease in such a way that it is not attributed to the Tai Chi or yoga alone. Okay. All right. So now we got to, now we got to consolidate all this and write it all out. Okay. So what additional information? So the control group, the control group will give us a baseline comparison to the actual treatment groups because um, other, I'll just call them other factors, because other factors at work could lead to a, I'll just say a change, whether it's an increase or a decrease, but could lead to a change in stress levels for all employees, not just the ones doing the Tai Chi and the yoga, uh, but everybody in general. Then we wouldn't know if the treatments Tai Chi versus yoga, if the treatments themselves were the main cause of a reduction in stress levels. So I'll be honest with you, there was one year that I had to grade basically the chapter four style question on the AP exam. And I just want you guys to picture, we've been writing a lot for these parts, right? Yeah. Um, we spent, well, I'm not going to say we spent the most amount of time because we all spent the same amount of time at the AP grading. Uh, but 
we were the slowest graders on this problem because there was so much to read versus like other people that only had to grade like a probability question that involved doing some some math, like not very hard math. Uh, they could fly through those problems. And then all of a sudden we're like, well, after five days, we've graded, I don't know, like 60% uh, of all of these problems. And then meanwhile, some other people that are on different questions, they're like, oh, well, we're like 90% done with ours. So then all of a sudden they get trained to do our question and then they felt our pain. They're like, oh my gosh, this takes forever to grade because there's so much writing involved with some of these problems. All right, questions with part B. All right, C. Is it reasonable to generalize the findings of this study to all employees of this company? <clears throat> Why not? Because they're volunteers. Yeah. They were volunteer employees. Now, when is it acceptable to generalize the findings of the study to all people? If they were randomly selected from all people, from all the, the population. So we're going to kind of answer that one of two ways. So in general, is it reasonable? No, because they were volunteers and not randomly selected from all employees. Now, if I cannot generalize the findings to all employees, who can we generalize the findings to? Right. So we can say, well, here, let me get a different color. We can generalize the findings to just the volunteers. And do you remember technically what other group we could? Similar. Right. And so I'll put this in parentheses here. And those who are similar to the volunteers. Now, someone first hour asked, what if I didn't write that part, the, the similar part? I don't think they would necessarily take off points, but it'd be like icing on the cake. Because again, what, what does it mean, people who are similar to the volunteer? Does that mean that they have to be like, like an identical twin? Like it's their doppelganger? Like how, what's the definition of being similar? And, and that's kind of up for debate. I don't know. So I definitely like just saying the volunteers themselves. That's who we can definitely apply this to. All right, questions with part C. Once, twice sold. Okay, number three. This is definitely gonna give you uh, the, the variety of corn blocking example that we did the other day. This is gonna give you those vibes. Students are designing an experiment to compare the productivity of two varieties of dwarf fruit trees. The site for the experiment is a field that is bordered by a densely forested area on the west, aka left side. So all of those little like, I don't know, blobs that are over here, that's the densely forested area. The field has been divided into eight plots of approximately the same area. So each of those little squares represents a plot. The students have decided that the test plots should be blocked. Now, Here's the part where we're going to have to really kind of dissect this next sentence because there's a lot to unpack here. Four trees, two of each of the two varieties, will be assigned at random to the four plots within each block with one tree planted in each plot. Got that? Everybody clear? I don't know why uh, whoever wrote this question thought that that was a proper... <laughs> I don't know, clear statement to make there, but I feel like they could have split that sentence up into two just to make it a little more clear. All right, so let's break that down. They want 
four trees. Now, when they say four trees, they're saying two of each of the two varieties. So two times two, there's our four trees. Now, here's what I would recommend that we do. Let's name the two varieties of trees. And I wouldn't necessarily call them A and B because later we're talking about blocking scheme A and B. So what if we just called the two varieties one and two? Now, we have variety one and variety two, and they're saying we want two of each of those. So in the end, there's going to be four trees, and what are those four trees really going to be labeled as? One, one, two, three. Right. There's going to be one and a one and a two and a two. So we got two ones and two twos, and those four trees, the two ones and the two twos, will be assigned at random to the four plots within each block. So when we look at, let's say, blocking scheme A, they're saying this gray shaded region here, that's a block. We're going to put two ones and two twos in those four blocks there, in those four squares. Same thing's going to happen like over here, let's say, in blocking scheme B. In this gray shaded region, there's going to be two ones and there's going to be two twos randomly assigned to those. Okay. So it says the two blocking schemes shown below are under consideration. For each scheme, one block is identified by the white region and the other block is indicated by the gray region. So now the first real question here, which of the blocking schemes, A or B, is better for this experiment? Um, block B. Um, guaranteed two trees of one type closer to the forest and two trees of one type further from the forest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. All right. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty here, you got to consider they mentioned something that was different in this problem. We got a densely forested area. And so, what do you think is going to be true about the trees in this densely forested area? From what? From what type of trees? Dwarf fruit, dwarf fruit trees. How big are these dwarf fruit trees? Morgan size. Wow. We have Solomon trees and Morgan trees. Okay. So we have small fruit trees. So I want you to imagine, this is where you got to think outside the box. What if we plant these small dwarf fruit trees right next to a densely forested area why might that be an issue? Why won't they do as well? Sure. Sunlight restriction. More nutrients out of the soil. What's the third thing all plants need? Water. So this densely forested area is going to probably start sucking away all the resources that these dwarf fruit trees need here. So we want to guarantee that both types of trees, that variety one and variety two, are going to guarantee to be planted next to that densely forested area. So now, blocking scheme A or blocking scheme B will accomplish that. A, a because it's guaranteed two of two of type one and two of type two next to the tree. It's got this one line right next to it. So That's a great question. Both we can do both. No, no. So here you're gonna end up with all of one type away from the trees and all of one type of right. the trees. So True, worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Let's say in the gray sh in the gray shaded block up there in blocking scheme B, we need to randomly assign two ones and two twos. What if this was how it randomly came out? And then let's say in the second block down here, we need two ones and two twos. And let's just say it randomly works out that this happened. What are we probably going to find out is true about variety number one? Probably sucked. Why? Is it because it's the inferior variety of dwarf fruit tree? Or was it because they all grew up against the densely forested area? We don't know, right? So... That's why blocking scheme A is going to be the better option here. Because again, let's say worst case scenario, I got one, one, two, two, one, one, two, two. 
take a look at that first block. Am I guaranteeing that I've got both types of trees growing up against the forest? Yeah. Do I got both types of trees growing away from the forest? Yeah. Now, there might be some other unknown variables. Did they mention about anything else that's different in these scenarios? Nope. No. But could there be some sort of like north-south difference? Yep. Probably. Maybe. We don't know, right? So there could be, I don't know, maybe there's maybe there's an underground river or something that, that flows right here. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, man, look, Variety 1 was planted right above that underground river or stream. It's going to pull a lot more water than these down here at number two. So there's always extra things to consider. But the only thing they mention as a confounding variable is that there is this densely forested area. So in the end, which one's the better one? A is really the better one. Now, A is better because it guarantees both varieties. No, wait, hold on. That's both varieties. Both varieties. I spell that right? Yeah. Okay. okay. That both varieties of trees will grow near and away from the densely forested, no, one R forested area, which might pull away sunlight, water, and or nutrients from the plots near them. So again, we won't know if the trees that are right up against the forest, is it because they're the crappy tree or was it because they weren't given the same opportunities to grow like the trees planted away from the forest? We don't know. The, the forest is a confounding variable. If there's something else that might present issues, lurking variable. All right. Now, let me just talk real quick here. Part B, even though the students have decided to block, they must randomly assign the varieties of trees to the plots within each block. What is the purpose of the randomization? Why must we randomly assign? You can, you can apply causation. Right, we can apply causation, and the randomization is going to hopefully reduce what type of effect? Right, it might help us reduce or eliminate any confounding that might happen there. All right. So over the weekend, I would recommend 